Hello, everyone. Welcome to Quantum Catechesis. I'm Father Joe Crump, and you are not. And today, today, today is Wednesday. It's at some point in April, and I think it's 2022. And we, what do we, there was something. Hot dogs. There's hot dogs tomorrow. And oh, today's show is being brought to you by the Hot Dog Stand in Grand Blanc, Michigan. Looking to have your hot dog needs filled? Why not try the best? I just made that up. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I do think it's the best hot dogs in the world. I'm serious. And they serve Kogel. Serve the curve, man. Uh, if you go there, you have. Well, that's a call from Hillsdale, Michigan. Maybe it's the hot dog stand. It's not the hot dog stand, it's Hillsdale. Uh, why am I telling you? What was I going to tell you? I was going to tell you something very important, and it had to do with something about... They serve Kogels. They serve Kogels. If you go there, I highly recommend the Polish dog. I've always been a Kogel Vienna guy, and then about my third or fourth visit there, she recommended the Polish dog. And, oh my, I've not had a Vienna since when I'm there. And a Vienna, make no mistake... Kogel does nothing wrong. Like, somebody said, well, you know, they they get bugs in there whenever they... I'm like, okay, then I like bugs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you ever hear people say that? Well, they say in every hot dog, there's a, there's a bug that fell in the... Thing. Okay, I like hot... I like, I like bugs. They don't eat much. Yeah, they don't eat much. And I also have something very cool to tell you guys on a personal note, before we get into all the Jesus stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you not familiar, for like 12 years of my life, although I've really taken it up a notch the last few years, I've been collecting, making a collection. And the collection is, I wanted a ball for every guy who played on the 1984 Tigers team, right? And uh, I'm down to two. Did you know this? Dwight Lowry, who's dead, and Glenn Abbott. Okay, Glenn Abbott is going to be in Detroit on Sunday doing his first public signing since 1986. And guess what? Fat boy's going. <laughs> I even have, if I may, here's how geeked out I am about this. So Glenn Abbott's a guy I have written like 10 times, but always when my letter gets there, he's moved, right? So I even have an official Rawlings Detroit Tiger baseball for him to sign. Oh, and I got two. And I'm going to have him sign these. So then all that's left, Dwight Lowry. Who's dead? Now, I know of one Dwight Lowry ball in circulation. One. Yeah, it was sold in Detroit four years ago for 1300 bucks. I'm serious. I even still have, I have the web page where the guy won the auction marked. <laughs> so I'm telling you this because Sunday, 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 theoretically the best thing going is Palm Sunday. But let's talk turkey. The second best thing is that Glenn Abbott is going to be in the Detroit area, Detroit area signing autographs. Now he'll only be there an hour and a half. And if I have to shove some old women out of the way, I'm shoving. I'm bringing two elbows. I'm going to pull a Mother Teresa. School is he? School is he? <laughs> you know, and in a time like this, the question is always, do you wear the cassock or do you not? Because it either really works for you or really works against you. Is he Catholic? Cassock. I don't know. Huh? He, she's asking if Glenn Abbott is Catholic. I don't know. <laughs> it helped me with Eric Haas. When I got Eric Haas's autograph, he was like, I go to, whole, I go to uh, Dearborn. Dearborn Divine Child. Divine he says, oh, Father, I'm a member of Dearborn Divine Child. I said, do you tithe? <laughs> okay, I didn't. We, <laughs> who was it? I saw a priest. Do you know about this? Uh, what's his name? Quarterback in San Diego for 100 years. Um, Rivers. Philip Rivers. Devout oh, Catholic. Yeah. Teaches religious ed at his parish. Ready? Tithes. He gives 10% of his income to the church. He had like a $50 million contract one year. One, one of it. Holy crap. How'd you like to be that priest? Tell everybody, you don't have to give. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're off. Yeah. And can you imagine, seriously, if he joined like a 400 family parish where the budget's like 700,000. What was collection this week? Five mil. <laughs> can you imagine being that priest? You get that check and you're like, 
Really? We got our fortieth statue this week. <laughs> <laughs> we built this. You built this cathedral, which uh, and we have no debt. You know. Uh, I mean, we don't have a Super Bowl either, but... Now, there was a famous quarterback. He and a famous quarterback switched places. Do you remember this? Was it Drew Brees? Yes. It was Drew Brees and him both played for the Chargers. That's what it was. Can you imagine being that coach? Anyway, I have no idea why we're talking about these useless things, but here's what I know. I'm going to meet Glenn Abbott on Sunday. There will be gushing. Right, I'm gonna gush. I'm gonna try not to gush, but I'll be like, nah, yeah. And then I might, I'm serious, pray that I'm brave. Because I'm gonna ask him if I'm brave, and I won't be. I'm going, okay, I've decided. I, I am. I'm gonna ask him if he's got a Dwight Lowry ball. Going in and I'll be like, I will give you my truck, which I'm leasing. <laughs> yeah, you gotta take over the payments, big guy. I don't know, maybe I should offer him Disco Jesus. Do you think? If he has a Dwight, Dwight Lowry ball, I will give you a Disco Jesus. Did you know this about Glenn Abbott? That him, along with Vita Blue, Paul Lindblad, and Raleigh Fingers combined for the first four pitcher combined no hitter in Major League Shut Baseball history. Up. What year was that? Do you know? Um, so what Chuck just said, if you didn't hear, uh, Glenn Abbott was part of a four-pitcher rotation that threw the first four-pitcher shutout or combined, perfect? Combined no-hitter. Combined no-hitter. Now, do you know the Braves just did, or not Braves, Kevin Nugent's team. The Brewers just did it last year, I think, yeah. with three or four guys threw a perfect game with more than one pitcher. Did you guys understand this? Do people get what I'm saying? So it's not one guy got out and threw nine innings. It's that four guys threw nine perfect innings together, which is just about impossible. But anyway, um, so what I think I'll do now is get into the show now that we've covered the important stuff. Uh-oh, Carrie's pointing. I Carrie's... think you know it's there. Uh, I don't see them. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was going to do that at the end, but you're right. No, no, no. no it's again. fine. We'll do it your way. <laughs> First, welcome to Marge and her husband to the QC. quantum catechesis family. I was going to say QD, which is quality dairy. And I have no authority to welcome you to the quality dairy family. Um, and I don't even know what that would entail. Like, what a quality, you know, quality dairy in Lansing? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was some ice cream. Um, and I want to thank Dan Stump and everybody for the birthday wishes. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, it's my birthday tomorrow. Yes. Uh, I was like, what? Well, Carrie and Chuck and I will be grilling hot dogs in the prayer garden area. Here at Holy Family, beginning at 10 a.m. until we run out or until noon. So stop by and grab a hot dog. But to be clear, after, go to the hot dog stand and get another one. Yeah. We want to support local businesses. Um, so that's tomorrow from 10 to noon. Carrie, Chuck, and I, and maybe Dad. I don't know if you're feeling saucy. I can eat. Dad can eat. <laughs> We're talking about the work part. <laughs> Where is the prayer garden area? Oh, between the fingers. Yep. Okay. And then you can look and maybe donate toward us fixing that someday. <laughs> Was that out loud? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's supposed to rain tomorrow so they can get a first. Yeah. Yeah. We got, seriously, guys, we got one of these things where we meet every once in a while, and I keep telling Carrie and Chuck, I'm so scared. Like, we have a big project to do there. The drainage problem is huge. It's so bad. Did you see this? Our brand new concrete sunk and cracked. A brand new concrete. So you can see it firsthand and enjoy a hot dog. You can have guilt and a hot dog, thus fulfilling all Catholic obligations. So <laughs> tomorrow, if you want, come on by the prayer garden. Uh, it'll be my 52nd birthday, um, and we will celebrate by eating hot dogs. So Carrie, Chuck, maybe Dad and I will be grilling. Um, come on by, truly. Uh, and we're gonna just go till we run out of hot dogs or noon because I have a show to do. <laughs> and I think I'm, am I doing the Holy Week show tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. So tomorrow, 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 I'll do the show where we walk through the Holy Week. This is my Kung Fu and it is very strong. 
And on a more serious note, oh, little angel. Okay, we're going to pray right now for little Hannah. Hannah is a four-year-old who was just diagnosed with a brain tumor. So, um, Heavenly Father, through the intercession of St. Peregrine, we ask that your Holy Spirit descend on Hannah in a powerful and unique way. Wash over her and drive this tumor from her body. Help her to trust Jesus and to be brave and help mom and dad during this time. And, and Jesus, any of the doctors, nurses, any of the pros involved, please guide them. But Lord, let's be clear. We are asking for a miracle. Deliver this little angel from her suffering. St. Peregrine, pray for us. Amen. And so, uh, Mom and Dad, if you live anywhere near Grand Blank, we have a first-class relic of St. Peregrine here. And he is the patron saint of people who suffer from tumors or cancer. Uh, and I would be honored to bless her with that. Okay? To be, uh, I don't want you to obviously feel pressure. Uh, but if you live nearby, within 14, 15 hours, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> if you live nearby, let us know, and we can hook her up. It'll take two minutes. Um, but please, no, you don't need that. You, you know what I mean? The Lord, I, I, I feel his spirit here. The Lord's going to do something. And so, um, yay. Okay, Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry. We love you. You're not doing this alone. St. Peregrine, okay? <sighs> yeah. You know about St. Peregrine? Fascinating life. What? Yeah? Yeah. You want to hear about it? Yes. All right, give me a second. I'm going to get out my notes because I don't want to miss it because my favorite thing is he beat the snot out of a priest at one point. I like this guy. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is a saint I get. Um... Let me find it here. Uh, so I don't remember relics. Here we are. Okay. So let's get after him. Uh, oops. Do, 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 do. Stick with me, folks. We got Antony of Padua. Okay. St. Peregrine was born in 1265 in Forli, Italy. I always want to say Flori, but it's Forli. Um, the first part of his life didn't seem to indicate there was any kind of saint in the making here. Okay. Uh, he was violently opposed to the Pope and Rome and joined a group that was all about, hey, stick it to Rome, which totally no one gets that better than me. <laughs> the Pope sent a priest named Philip Benizi, Benizi, huh? of the Servite Order uh, to try to bring people in that town back to the church. But when Philip got there and started preaching to the crowd, trying to tell them the truth, uh, he was dragged off stage and beaten by a mob, including young Peregrine, who pushed him down and beat him. Okay? And then he died. I'm just kidding. Wouldn't that be awful if that was St. Peregrine's story? Why is he a saint? We're not clear. Maybe the priest owed him money. <laughs> Peregrine started feeling really bad. Like, start, it, literally, the, the phrase I read was he was, quote, tortured with guilt. And so he uh, went back to the priest and asked his forgiveness. And the priest joyfully forgave him and they became inseparable. This is how Chuck and I met. <laughs> Chuck was there preaching some Pope thing and I'm like, ah, and uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he used his uh, blind windmill karate. Yeah. Uh, so Peregrine aggressively pursued a life of holiness and service, and the Blessed Mother appeared to him, and led, which led him to the Servite Order. He absolutely poured himself out in service to the poor and in his daily prayer life. He intervened in bad situations. He was a roughneck, and so he was kind of critical to people in the town when things were about to get violent. He would intervene and go and talk peace. And I love this. He brought so much peace and joy that people in town called him the angel of good counsel. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. This hot-headed dude. Like, I get, look at, I get the goosey bumpies, huh? At one point, he discovered a large, painful, cancerous tumor 
on his foot and he kept trying to work, but the pain was too great. Uh, the doctor and he agreed they had to cut his foot off. They had to amputate. The night before the amputation, Peregrine dreamt that Christ came to him and grabbed his foot and healed it. And when he woke up, the tumor was gone. For the rest of his life, people came to him for prayers. A lot of miracles came from his prayers. Some people said he simply whispered the sweet name of Jesus in their ear and they were healed. Uh, he died on May 1st in 1345. He's the patron saint of people suffering from cancer, tumors, AIDS, and other life-threatening illnesses. So that's our boy, Peregrine. If you see a picture of him, like when they do the pictures of him, he looks like a roughneck. And he's always got like this pussy, gross foot. I don't know. I would have showed like the happy foot. I would have had like the foot shiny because there used to be a tumor there. But they're like, no, no, no. That's what he was. Doesn't he look like a roughneck? I got a picture of him somewhere around here. And it's one of my favorite. Well, it's not an actual picture because, you know, 1345. But uh, actually, wouldn't that be cool if that was the miracle? We've got a perfectly good developed picture of him and cameras weren't invented yet. That's why he's a saint. I don't know. It's somewhere around here. The important thing, we're going to ask St. Peregrine to pray for Hannah. Can I get everyone to say, you know, today I will ask Jesus to deliver little Hannah. Uh, from this tumor, St. Peregrine, pray for us. Amen. Okay. Um, so now I got to find out how to go back to where I was. I'm not the most technically, technologically astute person, but my savage good looks make up for it. Okay. So with that, you may remember where we left off last week. And if you don't, that's because of your sin. Fear not, Jesus came to deliver you from that sin. Save us, Savior. Somebody on our show said they love that. The Save Us Savior line. Whoever you are, we're going to fight. Um, so uh, what we looked at last week was we started walking through uh, Jesus' life to see how does his life fulfill the Old Testament. OK, that um, we started with the birth of Jesus and now we're to the life of Jesus. Now, I'm not sure. I think we did not get to the parables, did we? No. Or wait. Wait a minute. I know. Isn't that funny? We were a little pushed today. We got here a little yeah, bit yeah. late. Carrie was drunk. And wait, no, we did, we didn't did. we? We talked, about, that we talked about how Jesus teaching heals us. Yes. yes. That what Jesus teaching, so we did. I don't think we hit parables too hard. We hit prodigal son, yes. but okay. Yes. And in fact, I think I said I would walk us through the prodigal son. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Who knows? It's my show. I'll do what I want. Brought to you by the hot dog stand. <laughs> the key thing to remember about Jesus' teaching is that his very teaching is healing. And I mean this. That's why we need to read scriptures for 500 reasons. But if you can't do it for God, do it for you. Right? Be selfish. This will heal you. And what you'll find often is that you'll feel this resistance. There's always this reason to not sit down and read this gospels. That's all the more reason to do it. That temptation is the flesh or the devil or both um, trying to keep you from doing what will help you be whole. That's how he works. It's how he rolls. <clears throat> Um, so make sure you read the teachings of Jesus, read the Beatitudes, read all these, all right, take them in, uh, and see in them the fulfillment of the law. That again, what the law can do is tell us what not to do. The law can tell us what to do, but what it can't necessarily do unless we let it is it can't heal our hearts. We will always, always come up with exceptions. And I think the weird example I'm going to use here, and I've used it a lot, so stick with me if you're a veteran listener. Um, but if you're a listener who's a veteran, please stick with me as well. Um, when you look at the Mass, okay, and I just had this argument slash discussion with the priest. Um, the, 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 the directives for the Mass say, don't add anything. Don't take away anything, right? And so, to, and I agree, right? It's not my mass. 
But at the same time, I think Jesus wants me to use my brain. Uh, yeah, you get me. Jesus wants me to use my brain. So there will be times where we add something that needs to happen. So for example, what's not in there? The blessing of people who come up for communion. And in fact, you know what? Let's do this. Sunday mass, you got squeakers. And it's not in the ritual that you bring the kid up and he gets a blessing or a statement, Jesus loves you. But we do that. Why? Because that's important. And there's parents who can't leave their kid in the pew. Now, at the same time, like when we do our all school mass, right? Think about this. There are more non-communicants than communicants. Well, it's a communion line. So we don't have the kids come up for blessing because it obscures what the line's for. Does this make sense? So I, I have a rule that I, and I follow it, but to me, God also wants me to use my brain. And if a parent is sitting there with a kid and is like, well, I can't go up to communion and leave this kid here. Well, yeah, bring them up. And if I see a kid, they're getting a blessing. But at the same time, if we ever get to the point somehow here where there are more non-communicants than communicants, then you say, well, it is a communion line. Let's make sure the line's about communion. Does this make sense? Okay. What Jesus is trying to do is show us what are the guiding principles to live that the law is to serve us. He even says... You're supposed to be Lord of the Sabbath, not Sabbath Lord of you. You obey the law and you live by the law, but you also understand that at times you're going to have to do something different. So, for example, by the time we get to Jesus, and Jesus completely gripes about this specifically. He says, you know, if someone falls in a pit, you won't help them on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. But then if a cow does, you allow them to do that. Wait, what's he pointing to? Is he saying you should leave the cow in there? He's saying, no, you should get the person too. Uh, you get me? This is what happens when you and I hear the law and say, well, what about this? What about that? Which is what we always do. Right? So Jesus is trying to show us through his parables and his teachings, how do we take on the mind of God? Which we won't be able to do without the Holy Spirit, but that comes way later. So you and I, who have the gift of the Holy Spirit, we read the Gospels and pray that he changes our mind to be like his. And that's how he fulfills the, the covenant through his teaching and through his arguments with the religious leaders and through his parables. He's showing us this is what God's brain and heart look like. This is how God thinks. And I, did I use the example of the woman with the 10 coins? No. Okay, so that's, to me, a great one. One of Jesus' shortest. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who has 10 coins and loses one. And she lights all the lamps and sweeps everywhere to try to find it. And when she finally finds it, she's so overjoyed that she invites all her fam friends and family over and throws a huge party to celebrate because she lost the coin and now she finds it. And you and I think, oh, cool. No, that's insane. All right? And that's Jesus' point. Um, God's love for us is by our standard insane because that party would have cost more than the coin. Uh, yeah, it's like where Jesus says, what man among you wouldn't leave 99 sheep to go get the lost one? None of them. <laughs> There's a crap load of sheep. You can lose one. They're dumb as rocks and they're cheap. <laughs> right? People didn't hear that and think, oh yeah, he'll go get every shepherd would go get the one. They'd be like, who is this loser? That's out looking for that lost sheep. He's lost. He's showing us the heart of the Father, right? I think I told you, Bishop Sean told me that. I love that. The parables are not practical teachings about what to do when. They're a revelation of the heart of the Father, right? This is God's beating heart. Oh, I could go on and on. And someday we will do the prodigal son. How are people doing? Good. Yeah? How else did Jesus fulfill the old covenant uh, through his miracles? Okay. Now, let's be super duper clear. Jesus f uh, appears to, I believe I'm right, okay? Uh, it's hard to do because I'm super hungry. 
<laughs> oh, sorry, did I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not hungry at all. It's just, it's a joke here that I'm always the guy going, so what are we doing for lunch? And I'm asking at nine. And and it's because people worry they about how skinny I am because they always say, Father, your weight. I'm like, I know. I know. <laughs> Because everybody left. No. Okay. <laughs> so it seems, I think I'm right when I make this statement, that for you and me, the miracles are the thing where we go, wow, that's everything. And for Jesus, they were almost a distraction. Yeah? Why? Remember when he fed 5,000? Wow, that camera's close today, isn't yeah. it? Uh, remember when... <laughs> Sorry, I'm not an attractive man, and I didn't expect to look and see me so close over there. Get a miracle. Let's heal this. Uh, now I don't remember. Oh, remember when he fed the 5,000 people? They got hungry again. Yeah? Remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead? Lazarus died later. Right? Every miracle he performed that we go googly over, and rightly so, they ended at some point. The spiritual liberation, the mind liberation that he was offering, that's the eternal. But we who are, remember what I said? We are body, soul, unities. Remember? Jesus is fulfilling the old covenant by showing us the body, soul, unity at work. He's healing our souls and our bodies. There were people who could heal bodies. There were people who could heal souls. Jesus is healing both. Okay? But his miracles also have a real specific point. And what's the primary one? Deliverance from evil. For you and I who suffer physically, um, that's a result of the fall. Okay? I was thinking of this the other day, and I'm not sure I'm right. I want to be really, really clear. I'm not sure that I'm right. Dad and I just saw a little, like, 10-minute thing on YouTube about tornadoes. And it was absolutely inspiring. Uh, whoever put this video together was showing videos people made up close and personal on tornadoes. And it was so awe-inspiring to see. And I was so glad I wasn't there. Yeah? And I think I'm right. Again, I'm not 100% sure on this. People were like, well, why did God make tornadoes? Well, how cool would it be if you were an eternal creature and could stand there and be in awe of that tornado and not be hurt. I assume that's how that all happened. I, totally speculating. You get me? That this phenomenon of tornadoes is a natural phenomenon that occurs. And if you were in your resurrected body that you'll be in heaven, that tornado's not fearful. It would cause you to cheer. It can't hurt you. And what it, right? So it's like watching it on that video and going, Wow, like one of the videos we saw a tornado formed, right? The dude said, it was just dumb luck. I was videoing out my window and it formed on a, um, the waterways in Denmark. Mm. And so you could see every part of it as it started to grab the water. And it looked almost like a cartoon, it was so cool. Mm. And it was on the water, it didn't hurt anybody. And it made it all the more incredible. But just imagine, being there. And I don't know. D does this make sense? Jesus shows in his physical miracles, his mastery over nature. And you may remember, like at one point it says, the disciples said, who is this guy? Even storms obey him. Right? Even storms obey him. Jesus, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Sorry, deliverance from evil. That in the end, all of the pain you and I experience is an effect of evil. Does it mean I did something evil so I hurt? Not necessarily. It might. You know, if you knocked off a liquor store and got shot in the process, yes, you're hurting because you did evil. Yeah? But pain is now a part of our life because our life is in a fallen world. And so it's deliverance from evil that he is seeking for us. The devil wants you in pain and darkness and in doubt. As Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief, that's the devil, comes to lie, kill, and destroy. I come so you might have life and have it more abundantly. So his miracles include exorcisms. 
And you may know it as a curious phenomena that in many of the exorcisms, when the demon sees Jesus, what does he say? I know who you are. You're the son of God. Why? They've seen him before. <laughs> Jesus is eternal. They see him and they know who he is. Why would they say that? Well, for a few reasons. Uh, Jesus, you may remember, was keeping that from people in a sense. Why? Because every time people started to get a sense of who Jesus is, what did they want to do? Do you know this? It says they want to carry him off and make him their king. They want politics. They want political liberation. He doesn't really seem to have much interest in that at all. Right? Seriously, think about it. He even tells King Pilate, what? My kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom was of the world, my attendants would be fighting for me. But as it is, my kingdom ain't here. He's not seeking you and I to be liberated politically. He's seeking to liberate us from evil. And evil's best shot at defending itself was what? To point you and I toward politics. You're the son of God. Everyone, oh, let's make him king. I don't want to be king. Now, I do. To be clear, Jesus doesn't. And that's why I'm not Jesus. One of the many reasons. I don't want to be king. I would be an awful king. I would be the worst. I would buy myself trucks <laughs> with your money. <laughs> okay. Uh, what did it used to be? A chicken in every pot? Wasn't that a slogan for somebody? Might it be like a truck in every driveway? Well, we don't want a truck. You will have one. <laughs> yeah. He seeks by his miracles to deliver you and I from evil, be it physical suffering, spiritual suffering, emotional suffering. And he makes clear also, as you may remember, you're not necessarily suffering because you did evil, which was the primary working theology of the day. If Remember the man born blind? What was the first question the Pharisees asked Jesus? Is this guy blind because of his sin or his mom and dad's sin? Holy crap. Yeah? That's just how people thought. Um, and Jesus says, ah, he wasn't born blind that way for either. He was born blind so I can show you the glory of God. And what's fascinating, we had a prof who broke this down for us. Um, Jesus healing a man born blind was the miracle they all talked about. Right? So if you read Josephus, for example, who's a secular historian alive at the time of Jesus, what does he write about? That. Why? That's the thing nobody had seen before. People had seen those who were lame get up and walk. People had seen folks they thought were dead stand up. Nobody had pulled off a guy born blind seeing. Yeah? I think we talked about this. They had a very loose understanding of death. Uh, they weren't quite sure when someone was dead. Um, seriously, I think we talked about this, right? That was the miracle that people talked about. And, and if you look at John, that's the one that gets him killed. Right? Um, yeah, we could go on and on. So his miracles are about delivering us from evil. And they show us his mastery over three things. One, evil. No demon could put up a fight. No demon really even tried, you may remember. You don't hear anything. And the demon cried. You know. No, no, no. They, they, they were cast out. They were cast out every time. A few times. Jesus did exorcisms a few blocks away. Remember that? Holy cow. That is mastery over evil. Um, and you may remember uh, Jesus' attitude about evil, and that's really fascinating. What's, what's the title he gives for the evil one? Beelzebub, right? And that's a Hebrew word. It means Lord of the Flies, okay? Meaning, what can a fly do? Irritate you, distract you, can't hurt you, right? Lord of the Flies. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. Evil, it's not hard for Jesus. And I know that sounds funny. And what we're going to see in Holy Week is Jesus doing this kind of spiritual jujitsu. Um, and I'm going to talk about this. Do I have the Good Friday homily, right? No. I can't remember. Lay does. Yes. Okay. Then I'll talk about it here. Because I, I wrote both and I couldn't remember which one I got. 
But when we say Jesus is a victim, we mean it. But make no mistake, it's not like a victim like, oh, I'm caught up in events. No, he's a victim because the devil had his territory. And what are they? Sin, suffering, and death. And he walked right up to the devil, face to face. Him on the cross was not a pathetic moment for God. And I can't, look at this. It's him going, give me your worst. Watch this. I'm dead serious. This was an in your face act on God's part. I'm done with you doing this to my people. You make them suffer and you kill them, make me suffer, kill me, see what happens. Seriously, this isn't victim like, oh, poor Jesus caught up in circumstances. Oh, he was in charge from beginning to end. The devil knew by killing him, he knew he'd rise. Well, then why did he kill him? Because he can't do anything else. He's got one tool in his bag. And Jesus knew that. All right, buddy, throw it at me. Let's see what happens. Holy cow. That's what kind of victim we're talking about here. And think about how powerful he is that he absorbed every torture the devil's got, right? Abandonment, betrayal, uh, torture, death, mom watching. Hmm. Think of it. And he was like, bring it, watch this. And what was the first act he did at his death? Went right down to Sheol and grabbed everybody there. The devil doesn't even get to catch his breath. This is an in your face. Jesus' dominance over evil is so complete and so total. That's why earlier you may remember, I think it was actually a Sunday homily where I talked about be careful with the whole evil movies thing, right? Careful with all the, oh, this demon possessed a person. and Careful with those. I, I tend to avoid them. And part of the reason I do is, and I'm not being funny here, they're silly. It's not hard for God. It's just not. Uh, it's always, oh, who's going to win? Oh, God. And the example I always use, right? I got this from Paul Dahl, right? I love that guy. He says, make a guy, make a dude out of Play-Doh. Challenge it to a fight. That's the equivalent, right, of God versus the devil. It's not close. The devil is much more powerful than us. But the gap between us and the devil is smaller than the gap between the devil and God. How are we doing? Jesus proves he fulfills the covenant by showing us, I am conquering evil. I am master over it. Uh, He also shows his mastery over the human condition, which we really hit on in the miracles part, right? So he shows his mastery over evil his mastery over the human condition, sin or sickness, suffering, and death. And he shows his mastery over nature every time. Yeah. Shows his mastery over nature. Um, for example, uh, at one point he walks on the water, um, and freaks the disciples out. Uh, and it would freak me out. It would It'd be like, Hey, Chuck, you know, um, But he also does it during a storm. Do you ever think about that? I I think of that. Like one of the times he walked on water, it was during a storm. Think about that. What the hey? Um, He calmed the raging storm. He calmed it while he was in the boat one time. It says he, quote, got up and rebuked the wind. Jesus was sound asleep. This is how complete his mastery over nature is. The disciples are in the boat. Jesus is asleep. And a storm is throwing them all over. And they finally wake him up. Are you not afraid we're going to die? And what does Jesus say? I could almost picture. (sighs) He rebuked the wind and said to his disciples, oh, you have little faith. And then he went back to bed. (laughs) Holy crap. Dude, you know what I mean? He's showing his mastery over all of it. And he doesn't do it by constantly flexing. Right, that's what the Pharisees do. Jesus just does it and moves on. Because this ain't hard for him. You get me? Um, 
this teaching of Jesus and this healing work of Jesus is all about deliver, showing us he's master over evil. He's master over the human condition. He's master over nature. All of it belongs to him. We've got three loaves and 5,000 people. Okay, he can do that. Um, one of the, and I think a lot of priests who say this, they mean well. I do. I really do. I just think they might not have thought it through. But like I, when I was a kid, one of the big things they would do when we would tell the story of Jesus multiplying the bread and fish, they'd be like, well, no, he didn't really multiply it. It's that uh, Jesus healed their hearts so that they'd share. Okay, two things. That's a culture that shares. Nobody has to be healed for that. I've seen it firsthand. It wouldn't occur to someone who has two pieces of bread to not give you one if you didn't have one. That's Americans. And I'm dead serious. Uh, remember, well, don't get into that. So what bothered me most about that growing up, when I started thinking about it, they're trying to make a human miracle. You and I don't make miracles. We make messes. God makes miracles. Yeah, that's a culture that shares. I can't explain this. It's just so ingrained into them. Remember, for example, it's in the Judaic law. If you have two coats and your neighbor doesn't have one and you don't give him one of yours, you're cast outside the city. Right? Holy cow. Um, that's the law. That was the literal law. Okay. You don't have to heal these people's hearts to get them to share. That's Americans. They weren't invented yet. Uh, Jesus shows his mastery over nature through his multiplication of the loaves, through his calming of the seas, through the fact that when Jesus died, nature threw a fit. Remember that? There was an eclipse. Darkness covered the land. There was an earthquake. Uh, nature threw a fit when he died. Um, his whole life is about revealing to you and me, this is what a healed human nature looks like. This is what the heart of God looks like. This is what the mind of God this looks like. This is what the power of God, all the things the law wanted to teach, he shows. Here you go. This is how we live. This is how we love. This is how we move. For example, uh, in the writing of the Gospels, it will show you bad geography sometimes, but they're doing it on purpose. Jesus moved from here to here and set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. It says that a few times. But if you look at the map, it's like, why would he do that? <laughs> well, they're just trying to show you wherever he went, Jerusalem was on his mind. Why? Because that's where he's going to go to die. What does he say? Um, there is a baptist. Oh, I just said... Uh, I have come to the earth to set a fire, and how I wish that day were here. Um, there is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great my anguish until it comes. What's he talking about? His baptism in blood. He's excited is the wrong word. He is anxious to get there and get it done. He wants you free. And wherever he went, he would face Jerusalem and set his face. You're not going to stop me. I'm going there to die. And why is he going there to die? Because he loves you. He wants you free. And he's going to get right in death's face. Okay. This is, to me, the most important thing that we can take from the life of Jesus as the fulfillment of the covenant. And what we'll look at next is how the death of Jesus fulfills the covenant. Now, <clears throat> I think we'll just start because it looks like we still have time. What do you think? Or first, wait, any questions on this? Oh, okay, got you. Let's go up there. Hold on, guys. <clears throat> what was Jesus' last miracle? Um, probably the healing of the, uh, well, it depends which gospel you read. It seems to me it's either the healing of the servant's ear that Peter hacked off, or it's the healing of the relationship <clears throat> between Pilate and Herod. I'd have to think it through, but it's probably one of those two. Um, what, what actually, you know, if, if this helps, think of this. This is huge, okay? And I'm so glad you asked this. Um, 
Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by last miracle, like rising from the dead. Yeah, yeah, you know, fairly partly cloudy huge. But I think you mean before his death, right? Uh, huh? I mean, pardon? Maybe on earth. On earth. Well, I would assume it would be his ascension to heaven then. If you mean while he was on earth, that would be his ascension to heaven, right? Taking our human nature up to heaven for the first time because now it was healed. Yeah. Um, the other one they talk about is the ear one. Yeah, remember uh, Cephas. Uh, the yeah, they're, they're classifying it as the last one before crucifixion. Yeah. Oh, would probably either be the hacking when Jesus healed the servant of the priest's ear or when he restored the relationship between Pilate and Herod, which I would consider miraculous, right? Two violent narcissists getting along. Um, yeah. Uh, an interesting thing, if I may, uh, that you guys might find, I don't know, it touches my heart. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, which are very similar, they follow the same basic timeline. This is the last thing that happens to Jesus before his death, before his passion. And in the, in John, John then, knowing that you know that, moves it to the beginning. Right, so that you will frame his whole life in the context. I love how John thinks, right? But what is it? It's what's called the anointing at Bethany, okay? And Bethany was a gal. I'm just kidding. Uh, so uh, the story goes like this, depending on which gospel you read, um, that Jesus was in Bethany <clears throat> at a house, and that a woman of questionable moral character, uh, depending again, which translation you go, I'm gonna give you my favorite one, or which gospel, okay? Namely, it says that a woman ran in and she had an alabaster jar filled with aromatic nard. <clears throat> she had some money. And that money appears to have been directed at a life of sin, okay? And it says she smashed the jar and on the wall behind Jesus and let the oil run over him. And that she fell down and she washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair and anointed them with that oil. Now it says that some of the religious leaders watching said, if this man were the son of God and knew who was touching her, he'd send her away. And Jesus said to the uh, Pharisee, whose name was Simon, there were a lot of boy men named Simon back then, right? Um, Simon, let me ask you a question. <laughs> right? And he walks him through uh, this whole idea <clears throat> of who needs a doctor? Do, do sick people need a doctor? Uh, and when I came in here, you didn't wash my feet, which would have been the custom, have a servant wash his feet. You didn't anoint me, but, but she's done it. <clears throat> and then he said, I promise that for the rest of time, whenever the story of the gospel is told, this will be in there because she prepared me for burial. So that oil, that aromatic nard was used for two things. One was for seduction, right? A prostitute uh, letting you know, because not to be funny, people all dress the same. Uh, it's not like you could tell, uh, much like now. Um, was that out loud? Let me just say sorry. Um, and then it says, he said to the woman, because you have loved much, you'll be forgiven much. Go and don't sin this way again. Isn't that cool? So she went on her way. What Jesus was pointing out was that nard was also used when someone died. Um, the way people did death was and burial was a little different. You have to remember, it wasn't like there was a ton of land where you could just put bodies in the ground and be done. What they tended to do was put someone in a grave and leave them there for a while and then pull the bones out and crush them and scatter the dust. Okay. Well, the decomposing smell, if you've ever been around that, is, it's the most repulsive, it's awful smell. Like the two worst things I've ever smelled was a body that had been abandoned, right? No one visited this woman and she died alone and was there for weeks. 
And I, I also, ugh, this is gross, but I, I was in the ER when someone died because they were burned to death. It's the two worst smells I've ever smelled. Um, so you covered their body with this nard because it's a pretty potent stuff. And you would hope that the nard would, in a sense, obscure the smell of the decomposing body. Such a dry climate that it worked. Um, she wasn't trying to seduce him. She was trying to prepare him for his death, and she didn't even know that. All she knew was her beautiful heart told her what to do. And sure enough, 2,000 years later, we're still telling that story. That you and me, we smashed the jar. She smashed her means to keep sinning this way. You had to put nard in that kind of jar, okay? Well, she smashed it. She can't live this. She broke with her past. And she served our God by crying on his feet and drying his feet with her hair, right? How beautiful, how raw, right? She's not worried about how she looks. So she's definitely renounced that life. And because she loved much, she's forgiven much. How cool is that? You don't hear the angries talk about this. You really don't. When you think about the people who are perpetually angry and always screaming about sinners, they just miss this whole thing. You know, uh, that's a miracle. Uh, you know what I mean? That's a miracle that someone reformed their life and was so public about it. Especially a time when, you know, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I just love that. I do. Um, and I love how John went, okay, everyone knows the story now. I'm going to move it to the beginning so that you can read Jesus' whole life on earth within the context of, we're going to kill him. And it won't stop him. Isn't that tight? Ah. Um, any other questions on this topic before we move to the death? Okay. So what I'll do now is a little intro to uh, looking at Jesus' passion and death. Okay. And the first word is the word passion. Okay. Um, oh, we do have one? one. Sure. About, okay. Uh, if you could expand on the miracle of Pilate and Herod. Oh, sure. It's just one sentence, okay? Uh, or two, maybe. It might be two. But it says that after... So, uh, so, sorry, guys. Give me a second to organize my thoughts. Think of Pilate as the Roman authority in Israel, slash Palestine, whatever you want to call it. Think of Herod as the puppet king, okay? So... He would be, you could say it this way, and it's incorrect, but it, it's close, okay? Pilate political, Herod religious, right? Pilate's the political muscle, Herod's the religious muscle, okay? And again, I'm way oversimplifying it. So when Pilate first encounters Jesus on trial, he's like, this is a religious matter, send him to Herod. He gets to Herod, Jesus does, and Herod wants him to do a miracle, right? Uh, hey, put on a show, big guy. Um, and it, it doesn't work. And Herod sends him back like, yeah, I don't know what to do with him. And Pilate's reluctance to kill Jesus, please don't take that as virtue, right? It, it's not virtue. It's Roman superstition. If he's who he says he is, I shouldn't kill him. And they wouldn't have been adverse at all to the idea of a god walking around like a human. But for Pilate, that God wouldn't let me kill him, right? So what does he do? Well, beat the heck out of him, see what happens. Yeah. Um, don't see Pilate as a sympathetic figure. He was an awful human being. But in the end, it says that after Herod returned Jesus to Pilate and Pilate condemned him, it just said, and from that day on, they became friends, even though they had been enemies all along. Right? So for some reason, something Jesus did bound these two narcissistic jack wagons together. Yeah. Isn't that weird? And I don't know why they mention it. It's got to be important because, again, they didn't waste paper. I'm really glad. It's hilarious. I look over and I'm like, whoa, that's me. That's me. <laughs> but, you know, if this helps, guys, I will be eating after this. <laughs> So why, <laughs> you know I'm not even hungry, I'm just farting around. Okay, so what we'll do now is take a look, uh, well, yeah, I think we've got to wait. you want me to wait? Yeah. Okay. 
Tomorrow, so I can't remember. Are tomorrow? Are we going to try to do triduum, or should I just continue this? We probably could do both, but I mean. That's a good point. I could skip Palm Sunday tomorrow, mm -hmm. right, and just go Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, and show how the services. I really hope you go. Are we going to televise them? Mm -hmm. Okay, or whatever you call this. Okay. Um, these are the highest points of the year, and I'm gonna be totally. I'm looking you on the eye, and I try to never BS you. Um, like Easter Vigil's hard for me. It is. I don't look forward to it. When it's done, I'm always happy I went. But it's super hard for me to sit that long. It really is, and it's also oddly enough a ton of thinking. Like, I've really got to be thinking a lot. I still don't understand the order of the service to some extent. I mean, I follow it because I know they're right. I want to be super clear. It's just like, well, why are we doing this then? I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what I'll do is walk us through those holy days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, try to give you a map as to what's going to happen. Um, and then we'll probably keep that a little bit separate from this, uh, although it'll be somewhat intertwined. I'm sorry I'm so vague. It's Carrie's fault. She's drunk. So I'll be doing it on a full belly, unlike today where I'm suffering just like Jesus. <laughs> Stand up and tell us that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm due any day now. Okay, um, so, uh, and then Friday, we'll do our usual question and answer. Although, if we're feeling saucy and we're not done with Triduum, we might do that. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in, truly. And uh, if you would, uh, please like and share these. Uh, if you would, subscribe to the podcast, whatever your provider is. You just look for Joe in Black Ministries. And then please subscribe to it. Uh, and, and really all of that helps us. We are starting to get advertising stuff on our YouTube. We received a $10 billion pesos check yesterday. Okay. That's not true. To 50 cents. Yeah. It's, it comes out to about 56 cents. <laughs> Should I tell them about the $3 homily, Carrie? <laughs> if, if I told these people about this, so. this is one of my favorite Carrie things. Okay. And there's a million things, <laughs> but this might be the top. Um, like she gets this thing every once in a while that'll show like, okay, this video you guys did, you got a buck 50, right? From commercials or whatever. And what she, <laughs> like all my homilies, they publish like on her sheet with a dollar figure next to it. Like how much, so <laughs> she would be like, well, Joe, that was a $4 homily. And I can't figure out if a $4 homily is good. I know, it's like, I saw one that was like a $13 homily and I was like, yes, I am master of the spoken word. But it was hilarious. So every once in a while, I'll finish up mass. I'll be like, you know what I do? I'm, I get a little insecure because I know my head's working so fast. I'm not sure if I'm doing it right for people. And probably I'll be like, yeah, it was 450. <laughs> and I just think that's the best thing ever. Um, so thank you, YouTube, for quantifying how good my homilies are. <laughs> Speaking of which, gave a short one this Sunday. I did two, two yeah. eight-minute homilies together. Uh, but we put it up late because Gary was drunk. And if you miss this Sunday's I mean, I feel so self-serving saying this, but no, no, do it. Uh, it, check it out, please. Yes. I, I feel like it was funny. I called Carrie afterward and I was like, Carrie, I, I did a good job. And I never think that. Like there's times I'm like, I did all right. But this one I finished, I'm like, boy, because it hurt me giving that homily. I had to punch. I got punched a few times. Uh, but I thought it was pretty good and helpful. And forgive me for my candor on that. But uh, uh, if you get a chance, check it out on my Facebook page. The name of the homily is Jesus Drives Away Our Accusers and Shows Us Mercy. And it's been a theme of my spiritual life just in the last four days. Truly, the Lord's really taken it up a notch that I let the devil accuse me in my head way too much. And uh, my sister Lori said a powerful thing to me. She said, Joe, you need to pray this prayer. Satan, get behind me. Jesus, be always before me. And I've probably since I talked to her on Saturday, I've probably prayed that a million times. Um, 
you know, she just pointed out, Joe, you let too much get in your head from the evil one. And you think about it. Why? Give him the attention he's due. <sighs> Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Ugh. Okay. So, with that then, salad pray. Do you know, poor Martha, my Martha, she had to explain to people <laughs> on Facebook, they were like, salad pray. She's like, listen up. <laughs> Martha, I award you 12 Jesus points for your patient and diligent explanation <laughs> of salad and pray. And I will take those 12 points from the people who deprived me of lunch. <laughs> People I know are worried about how skinny I'm getting. I am. They're like, Father, your weight. I know. <laughs> what was, there was a mastery show where I'm serious. I looked at him and went, oh, I'm getting big. <laughs> I forget which one, but my brother Paul was there and he went, what do you mean getting? Which, you know. <laughs> and does anyone know where this toothpick came from? Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did it go in? No. Okay. Anyway, Carrie will stop messing around. I'll lead us in prayer at the creepy cam. <laughs> Do you see creepy cam? Look at that screen, Chuck. And you guys see how out of control my beard is today? I didn't iron it. Wow. Yeah. No, oh, I'm trying to straight. Okay. Uh, what are we doing? Prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we don't have to guess how to live and love like you. We don't. Into our spiritual skin so that our heartbeat sounds just like yours. That's what we want, Lord. Help us to seize those moments you give us. Lord, you see the suffering of these poor people in Ukraine the horrors they are enduring, the hunger, the cold, the violence, all of it. Lord, please drive the, drive the invader from their midst and give them their home back. And help all of us who are rushing to send them weapons to be willing to also send them food and whatever they need to rebuild. Father, the holiest week of the year is coming. And if we've kind of blown Lent to this point, help us to start over today. Help us to start over with great joy and hope. Because it's not about us, it's about you. For all of those people we love so very much and we think about and fret about, and for all of those circumstances in our lives that cause us worry, we give all of it to you, Lord. And we love you, and we trust you. And may the blessings of Almighty God be with you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you beautiful people, thank you for tuning in. Also, you ugly ones, too. Is it over? No, it's never over.